Sí. Um, yeah, well, I have to show something also first. Maybe some of you have noticed already, but yesterday we changed somewhat on the schedule for next week. So the, the uh, uh, study time for the process technology has been removed because you're going on an excursion. And it's to Korste for the processing plant there. You're going to spend half the day until about noon uh, uh, in, uh, in the processing plant, getting a, a tour there and uh, some stuff. I don't have all the details. Uh, the course part has been uh, arranged by Torbjorn, so he has more details on that. Uh, afterwards, you are going down to the docks and you're going uh, uh, on board one of the tugboats so that you're going to get to see the hydraulic systems that they are using on, on the tugboats. I think what they said was that they were uh, was going to split you into three groups of about 10 students on each group. And then they would uh, bring you both to the bridge to see the bridge of the, the uh, tugboats and on deck to see the hydraulic system and also down to the machine room to, to see the uh, machinery there. So I think that will be, be uh, very, very nice. Unfortunately, I can't join you because I have a lecture with uh, my Norwegian students at from 10 to 12, so uh, I can't really join you, but Runa will, will uh, come with you for that part. So I, I believe also Torbjorn will be with you for the process technology part and then Runa for the hydraulics parts uh, there. <coughs> also, we've made some changes for the week afterwards. So then you are going to be split into two groups. We are going to use the same groups as we use in the CAD because we have an overlap here with the uh, CAD study time. Uh, you will be followed by uh, Fredrik, I believe. Uh, he'll be coming back with more information on this one. I'm just giving you a heads up that something is happening in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and that will be a course uh, that you will go through over at uh, Simsi, which is a uh, four or five minutes walk from here. Um, and that course is basically an ROV pilot course. So you will be doing an ROV simulator. So I think that will be very, uh, very fun for everyone uh, to take a part in that. I think it will be, you will be split into two groups when you're over there. So, so when, when group A is there, they will be split into two groups where half the group will be doing the simulator and the other half will be doing some uh, theory stuff with regards to the simulator. And then you will switch around. Uh, and, uh, and so everyone will be, uh, have their turn in the, in the simulator. <clears throat> so on, on the Thursday, it's very important that we have the people from, from the CAD group B uh, go, to the, uh, go to this course since that is when group A have their, uh, have their uh, CAD study time. So that's why we've uh, split it up like that. Uh, because the, the only possibilities we had was from 8 o'clock to 12, so we couldn't really, if we were using any of the other days, we would be crashing into a whole lot of uh, lectures. So the week afterwards again, so the three next Wednesdays, uh, then we'll have a uh, short excursion to Chillinge, where they have the pipeline repair system. Uh, the, their base is at uh, Chillinge, uh, to the north of uh, Haugesund. So we will uh, have an excursion there. That will be, uh, you will be accompanied by me and Frederick uh, for that one. Uh, and we will get to see all of their basically emergency equipment to fix any leaks on, on uh, pipelines uh, subsea. So that's going to be a, a nice one also. Um, so we have that one. And that's everything for the, uh, for the uh, time edit part right now. So we have, we have uh, a couple of busy Wednesdays ahead of us here. Uh, and as you can see, the, the um, hydraulics lecture for next week had already been canceled for a while because we knew that this, uh, the excursion for next week was coming. We didn't quite know about this course because we didn't quite know if we were, uh, would manage to be able to do it. But the hydraulics lex lecture on that Wednesday has also been, been removed because of that uh, uh, SIMC course that you're doing. So, <coughs> But we are... We are way ahead of schedule in the hydraulics, so it shouldn't be a problem at all. 
So we were talking about diving methods and gear, or ba basically we had gotten to diving methods and gear in the last lecture. We have been talking about uh, the uh, physiology of uh, the human body uh, when we are uh, diving and pressures and temperatures and uh, all of the effects that will, uh, will be something to consider uh, for a diver and uh, the whole support uh, team around the diver. Uh, now we'll s start looking more about how they are diving and what kinds of gear they're using, what kinds of tasks they're doing. So usually we separate diving into two different categories so that we have inshore diving and we have offshore diving. So we'll look a little bit at the inshore diving first. And that's along the coast, in the rivers and in lakes or basically anywhere that's very close to land where you're going to perform diving. That's inshore diving. And traditionally, they use a helmet with a, connected to a, with a, a hose to an air supply. And of course, their, uh, their diving suits uh, and anything like that. And that's the, the traditional gear they use. And mostly, it's basic construction works. So it's the same kind of construction works that you would do on land. Just it has to be done underwater instead. <coughs> and they are using lightweight uh, equipment if they are just doing an inspection or very light work. So if they're just moving around some stuff or uh, just swimming under a pier to, to check that everything is all right there uh, with an inspection, then they will use regular, more like scuba diving gear. And their breathing gas is usually uh, just regular air. So they won't, they won't bother with doing anything uh, other than just compressing regular air. <coughs> Unless they are going to go deeper than 50 meters. But usually if they need to go deeper than 50 meters, they're usually offshore. So that with inshore diving, they, they usually stay above 50 meters. And this is actually regulated by law. So they aren't allowed to go, go further down uh, than that. So there's actually a... a uh, uh, I think they have the same 50 meter uh, limit in, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, and there is supposed to be a lake somewhere in, in Great Britain that is slightly deeper, so, so 53, 54 meters deep. Uh, and uh, there uh, are uh, a couple of uh, jokers among the local divers there because they've been putting out loads of small statues of garden gnomes and stuff along the, um, along the bottom of the lake. And this is supposed to be a, a uh, sort of, uh, uh, what's it called, a, a nature reserve uh, in this lake. So it's not supposed to have loads of uh, human-made stuff in it. Uh, but the divers from the police, they're not allowed to dive further down than 50 meters because that's their, they're regulated by law. So just a couple of meters further below them, that's where all of this stuff is. And they can't go down and get it up because they're not allowed to dive any deeper than that. <laughs> so, so they have uh, they have sort of a, a small tug of war there between the uh, between the uh, divers from the police and and the the local divers that are playing uh, practical jokes on them. So, so it's not always all that easy with having a regulated uh, limit like that. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, actually, if you're doing scuba diving on your uh, uh, spare time, uh, you you will already know this, but, but for those of you who don't do it, is the first uh, course that you do to, uh, for scuba diving is down to 30 meters. And then you have to do one extra course in order to, to be, be uh, registered as a diver down to 50 meters, so that you are allowed to do that. So, so it's actually two different, uh, two different courses uh, to take in order to get the correct certificates for, for diving. <coughs> and that has to do with, once you get once you go down to about 30 meters, it's fairly easy using air as a breathing gas. But once you pass those 30 meters and down to 50, uh, you, you need to pay extra attention to decompression uh, and stuff like that. So, so that's why they have a separate course for, for those extra deep ones. <coughs> and as always, when we are using air, we really need to, to pay attention to our decompression, our temperature, and the possibility of gas poisoning. Uh, from both oxygen and nitrogen. So, so it uh, ca can be quite dangerous. But, but also carbon dioxide can be, can be dangerous in, uh, in uh, diving like that. And it is the main reason why um, just scuba diving is classified as an extreme sport. It's 
basically because if you if you don't pay attention you risk your life uh, when you're doing it so that's why it's extreme <coughs> uh, with uh, regular diving gear uh, you usually have there's the the standard scuba diver uh, with the uh, the swimming feet and uh, a tank of air on his back to, to breathe and this mask uh, with the uh, with the hoses going to the tank and also a belt with weights on them because <coughs> uh, the combined buoyancy of the diver himself and the neoprene suit that they're wearing the diving suit is quite a lot of buoyancy so, so uh, if you if you just put on a, a neoprene suit like that and you just jump into the water you're going to just basically float on top of the water you're not even going to sink uh, very far down put on a tank of gas on your back and you're going to sit a bit further down in the water because, because the tank is fairly heavy but you're still not going to sink so, so you're still going to be floating uh, on the surface so then you have to add weights uh, on a belt around your uh, around your waist in order to to uh, actually manage to sink down and usually they try to uh, they, they do some uh, quick calculations just to check how much how many kilograms of weight do they need around the waist in order to become approximately neutral uh, in water so, so so they want to be so, so that if they swim down to a certain depth they're going to stay at that depth they don't really need to use a lot of energy and uh, do many motions in order to keep themselves at that depth they won't sink down and they won't rise up <coughs> uh, if you're doing uh, that that's for the inspection work and light work so if you're doing more uh, more heavy work in the construction uh, parts then you would probably have a hose coming down and an, a helmet uh, connected to the hose so that you won't be carrying your air supply on your back you will actually be connected to the surface and, and get your air from uh, from the surface which of course means that you can stay for a longer duration on the water uh, because also when you're doing heavy work your uh, muscles they need more oxygen which means that you are breathing more so, so you are making more air move through your lungs uh, that means that you are using up your air more quickly so for lightweight work it doesn't really it, it's not a problem bringing your air along you in a tank because you're, go you're going to not really going to be uh, very short of breath. You're not going to do any heavy lifting or anything like that. So, so you can really, uh, you can have really great control over uh, the amount of air that you have left in your tank while, while you're diving. But if you're doing very heavy work, then suddenly you will use more of your oxygen, and it can very quickly drain a tank like that. So that's why you have the hose connected to it. And then it's just a question of, are you going to do work? Uh, where you need to swim around then you will have the gear that this guy has on him or are you going to do work along the bottom of the uh, of the ocean there so then you will have more like this gear you will be raised down or lower down on a, uh, a platform and you will have a suit like this you will have some weights uh, up top but you will also have some very heavy uh, boots on so that the boots will basically be dragging you down to uh, to the ocean floor so that you can walk around uh, they're not heavy enough to make you uh, be able to walk around like you do on land it's going to look more like astronauts on the moon so that if you jump you're going to jump really high so, so it's a sort of uh, you have to be f a little bit careful about uh, the movements that you're doing uh, you, they can be quite exaggerated if you use too much force when you are when you're moving around um, yeah and here we see uh, a bit of a close-up uh, with the gear that they use when they're walking around you can see that it's uh, it's pretty heavy gear that they're using but even though it's very heavy it's still buoyant enough to uh, to actually lift them unless they uh, pack a lot of weight with them <coughs> then we're going to look at offshore diving because that's the one we're most interested in w with regards to our subsea technology that's uh, that's where we that's where we have the the deepest dives and everything <coughs> but the offshore diving is usually uh, divided into two categories also uh, where we have surface diving and there they also use air as their breathing gas and it basically just means that if you're on a rig uh, a platform uh, or something like that or, or even on a vessel you're going to be 
lowered into the water from the surface and you are going to be swimming around the, the legs of the platform or underneath the vessel uh, in order to do, do some maintenance work or inspection. So, so it means that you're very close to the surface. <clears throat> and that is also why you can use air as your breathing gas. And the gear they're using, it varies quite a lot depending on the task, like with inshore diving, if it's lightweight work and or uh, inspection or something like that, it might just be a regular scuba diving gear that they uh, use. But if they are actually going to perform work tasks, if they're going to, to be uh, uh, grinding uh, metal or cutting something or maybe even welding, uh, they can actually perform welding underwater. It just means that the, the weld isn't going to have the same kind of strength as if you do it in the air. Um, and that's mostly because the water is going to cool it so quickly um, compared to what, what the air does. <coughs> uh, but they, they do quite a lot of different types of works uh, and they use more or less the same kind of gear as one would use inshore uh, with regards to using, uh, using a helmet with a hose uh, if they're doing heavy work and, and scuba gear if they're doing light work. Uh, and they usually don't go any deeper than 30 meters when, when they're offshore uh, and doing surface diving. And for, for the uh, more shallow dives, they use a diving basket, like the one we saw uh, earlier, where you just like a platform, basically. Sometimes they have uh, railings so that you can fall off it. Um, and they just use that to lower the diver down from the, from the side of the rig or, or the vessel. Um, that's if it's fairly shallow. If they're going all the way down to 30 meters, uh, it might be that they are uh, using a diving bell instead. Uh, because when you're using a basket like this, uh, the diver has to spend more time in the water because he is in contact with the water from the very second that he hits the surface of the water. Uh, so that if you are lowering a, a diver down to five meters, he's only going to be in contact uh, with water from the surface of the, uh, the ocean and down to those five meters before he starts doing his work task. And then when he's done uh, doing his work, he will still be in contact with water until he's been raised up those five meters and out of the water. But the thing is when you're offshore, the water is really cold. So you, you, uh, you want to be, make sure that he's going to be able to perform his uh, work before he, he gets too cold. Uh, so being able to to make sure that the diver spends less time in the water means that he's going to have more time to doing his actual work. So less travel time in contact with water, basically. Uh, and yeah, and then we have a scuba diver doing some work. There's a typical helmet that's being used. Didn't I have the one with... Uh, there was supposed to be uh, another, uh, another remark there about the diving bell. Because usually if it's deeper than 10 meters, even though they're just going down to, to 20 or 25 meters, and they're not going to use anything else than, than uh, air as a breathing gas, they're still going to use a diving bell. Because they want to, uh, to avoid having to lower the, the uh, um, diver all the way down uh, while he's in contact with water. So he's going to be sitting Riley inside a diving bell while he's being lowered down. And once he's down at the proper depth, he's going to open up the hatch and the diving bell is pressurized so that the, the air inside the driving, uh, diving bell has the same pressure as the water in the depth where he is, which means that when he opens up the hatch in, in the bottom of the diving bell, the air can't be compressed anymore by the water because it's, it's already been compressed to, to the correct volume which also means that the water isn't going to be gushing into the diving bell. It's just going to stay there as a, a normal uh, water surface. Uh, so then he can uh, plunge into the water and do his work uh, at that depth. And also by using a diving bell there, uh, it's much easier for them to regulate the decompression of the diver. Because if the diver is lowered down when he's using, uh, lowered down while he's standing on a basket uh, like that, when, when they are raising him up, then they can raise him up a couple of meters and then they have to have a break. So then he has to stay there for a little while because uh, the gases that have been dissolved into the tissues and blood of uh, his body, those need to have time to be transported to the lungs and be diffused into uh, his uh, breathing. 
because if they just pull them all the way up, then he's going to get these gas bubbles forming I I inside his tissues and everything, and he's going to have decompression sickness. So standing on that basket, being lowered down isn't really a problem, but being raised up again means that you are constantly stopping at different levels in order to, uh, to have the pressures equalizing uh, and have the gases uh, diffuse from, from uh, the body. Putting him in a diving bell, that's a lot easier because when he goes back into the diving bell, he's dry already. So when he gets into the diving bell, he can pull off the, uh, the diving suit and he can sit there and can towel himself off. It doesn't really have all that much space in there. They're really cramped, those diving bells, but he has enough space to pull off the wet, uh, wet diving suit and towel himself off, get dry and warm so that he's not freezing anymore. And then they can just pull the diving bell up to the surface and then they can slowly but surely lower the pressure inside it so that he will have a controlled uh, decompression inside the diving bell. So, so it's a lot, lot more safer way of doing it than, than actually uh, having to gradually lift. Yeah? Well, if uh, so, so the question is if if the uh, if the pressure of the inside the diving bell isn't equal to the pressure uh, outside it. So, uh, if it's more, if it's a greater pressure inside the diving bell th than it's outside, then uh, what will happen is that the air will escape from the diving bell once he opens the hatch. Uh, and potentially, if it's a lot larger than uh, a lot greater than, than uh, the water around it he can uh, experience decompression uh, sickness down there. Uh, if it's less, then he's going to have a problem because as soon as he opens up the, the hatch, the water is just going to flood into to the diving bell and that can be very forceful. So it could potentially just crush the diver if it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it depends on uh, usually the, the, um, the uh, hatches on the diving bells are open outwards. Uh, so, so that if, if there is too little pressure inside, he, he's not going to be able to open it outwards because he has so much pressure pushing on, on the hatch. So, so there is a safety mechanism there. But, but uh, the point is that if, if there is just a small difference, the diver will most likely be, be strong enough to, uh, to push it and maybe he will get uh, a couple of centimeters of water coming in more than he, he's used to if he has too little, uh, little pressure. If he has too much pressure, might be that some air escapes, but, but usually the pressure will be, uh, be uh, equal, uh, more or less, so, so that uh, the difference won't be noticeable to the diver. So, uh, and and uh, that's also one of the reasons why they have such large support teams on the diving vessels. Is you have many people that are sitting around just watching all of the values, making sure that everything is okay, because it's so dangerous doing this uh, diving stuff that you, you need to have many safety nets where you can be, uh, someone can catch it if something is wrong. And that is often, <coughs> if you see documentaries about diving incidents wh where there have been loss of life or, or uh, traumatic injuries uh, or something like that, you, you can often trace it back to, uh, there might have been a technical failure or something, so it wasn't really anybody's fault, but most likely someone wasn't paying quite close enough attention because if they had been paying the, the amount of attention that they were supposed to do when they were on work, they would have caught the, the technical failure uh, and been able to, uh, to uh, sort of avoid the whole situation. So, so it's, uh, even though uh, there are of course accidents that have happened that are purely technical failures where no one could have saved it uh, if it was a problem, there are also plenty of accidents where if just uh, the right person had been looking at the right screen at the correct moment, he would have caught that something isn't quite right here. We need to, uh, we need to pause now and, and figure out what's going on. But instead they carried on and something bad happened. So, so it's, uh, it's very important to ha try to have everyone in their correct places and doing their jobs properly when they're talking about diving. Because after all, we're talking about the human lives down there that, that will be most likely be lost if something goes wrong. So it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, it's 
pretty serious when, when we're talking about this. It's not just a ROV costing um, some a uh, million dollars or something that gets destroyed. A million dollars is a million dollars, of course, but it's still just materials that have been destroyed if, if something goes wrong. But if you're losing a life, that's very serious. <clears throat> and so then we'll look at the next uh, division of offshore diving, which is saturation diving. And this is when we're, uh, we, we stop using regular air as the breathing gas because we're, we are supposed to go so deep that the amount of oxygen that is in regular air is going to uh, create too high of a partial pressure uh, when it gets down to the, the correct amount of pressure. And as we were talking about, 0 0.2 bars, that's uh, about the, the correct amount of partial pressure that we need if we are... Uh, increasing the total amount of pressure. So in regular air, we have about uh, 0 0.2 bars of oxygen. And we're just going to round it off a bit, 0 0.8 bars of uh, nitrogen. Of course, we have a couple of other gases in there as well. <coughs> but that is if if our total pressure is one bar. So if we are going to, because you remember the, uh, the uh, I can't remember the name of the law, but we have the one with P1 plus P2 plus Pn, that e equals our P total. So we, we do the partial pressure of all of the gases, we plus them together, and then we are going to get our total pressure. So in the case of regular air, we have 0 0.8 bars of nitrogen, we have 0 0.2 bars of oxygen, and together they make the one bar uh, pressure that we experience in our atmosphere. But then if we, if we uh, continue using this equals that we have 20% uh, O2, and 80% nitrogen. I'm just simplifying this very much now. It's 79 and 21, of course, but just to make it a bit easier when I'm doing my calculations here. <coughs> if, we, if we keep these, uh, these values, these percentages, by using regular air when we're going deeper down, we're going to increase our total pressure, and it's going to become quite a lot more than, uh, than five bars, which is down to 50 meters, or six bars is down to, to 50 meters. And if we're increasing it down to, uh, to uh, 100 uh, meters, then we have 11 bars of pressure. And with 11 bars of pressure and 20, uh, well, let's say 10 bars, just to make the, uh, the calculations easier, uh, with 10 bars of total pressure, so our that will equal being uh, at a depth of about 90 meters. If we keep keep these percentages uh, of just using regular oxygen here, that means that we have the partial pressure of oxygen will be now two bars. But we already know that 0 0.2 bars, if we stray too far from 0 0.2 bars, it's going to become toxic to our bodies. So just by using regular air and increasing the pressure to, it's not really much with 10 bars. You get in, in regular air compressor to, to, to use air tools in your uh, uh, pneumatic tools, if, whether you're changing tires on a car or whatever you're doing, that's usually six bars of air pressure. So, so it's not really much uh, pressure with 10 bars, but still you're going to be way above the, the line where, uh, it's, uh, where the oxygen has become toxic to your body, which means that you need to have a much smaller percentage of oxygen in the gas that you're breathing in order to, to, uh, in order to, uh, to survive, basically. And that also means that uh, if we're just going to s continue using regular air with nitrogen and oxygen, it would mean that we would have to decrease the percentage of oxygen quite a lot, and we would have to increase nitrogen. But we also know that in too high of a partial pressure, nitrogen is also toxic to us, which is why we need to replace the nitrogen with something else. <coughs> And what is usually done is uh, replacing it with, uh, uh, with helium. It wasn't the next one there. I thought it was uh, the next 
summer. What we usually do is we we decrease the amount of oxygen used in our uh, in our breathing gas, and we replace nitrogen with helium. <clears throat> One of the positive effects of this is that the helium is, uh, of course, that's the, if you look at the periodic table, it's just the second element on the periodic table. You have hydrogen up in the first corner, and then you have helium over on the other corner, the other tower of the uh, periodic table, which means that I it's, uh, it's the second lightest element that we have. And since it's much lighter than nitrogen, uh, when we are increasing uh, the pressure of this gas, we are also increasing the density because we are pushing more gas into the same volume. So, so the weight is going to increase. Uh, and being able to switch from nitrogen to helium, which is a lighter gas, it's also going to make it a bit, light, uh, a bit easier for, for the uh, uh, divers to breathe. <coughs> and of course, breathing uh, uh, will still be heavy because... Uh, depending on, on the pressure, it will be, uh, the density will increase to the point where it's going to be denser than regular air, so that you're actually going to feel it when you're breathing. It's going to be heavy, heavy stuff uh, moving uh, all of the air in and out of your lungs. <coughs> and the helium is, of course, uh, one of the noble gases because it's all the way over on the, on the side of the uh, periodic table and all of the elements over on the uh, right side of the periodic table those are noble. They won't, they won't uh, bond to any other elements. So th they just stay that way. Which means that helium isn't dangerous for us to breathe. So, so it's uh, completely safe. Now you might, some of you might think a little bit, well, it's just the second lightest uh, gas that we have. We could use hydrogen instead. That's even lighter. But the problem is if you put hydrogen and oxygen together, you get... Uh, just to do a direct translation from Norwegian, you, you get bang gas, <laughs> which is what we call it in Norwegian, because that's going to blow up. It, it really does need a lot of heat in order to, to ignite uh, and blow up. So, so you, you really don't want to be breathing hydrogen and oxygen uh, when you're uh, diving. So helium and oxygen, that's the safest bet uh, to do. So that means that uh, we can put quite a lot of a percentage of helium into our gas, uh, so long as we make sure that the percentage of oxygen is going to give us a partial pressure approximately of 0 0.2 bars. So that means that the divers that are uh, going really deep, 150, 200 meters, they're going to breathe mostly helium and just a little bit of oxygen. But it's going to be enough to keep their bodies uh, running. So, so they're going to get uh, the oxygen that they need. <coughs> Yeah, b because uh, even though we need to stay fairly close to 0 0.2 bars, uh, so, so if you go down to 50 meters, which is the legal limit, th then you're at 6 bars. So, so you have the possibility of, uh, you, you have a certain range of movement here. Uh, so, so you can go uh, to a slightly higher uh, partial pressure of oxygen. And that is why they have this limit of 50 uh, 50 meters depth, b because once you pass those 50 meters, you're starting to move into uh, such a high partial pressure of oxygen, oxygen that it's going, to, uh, it's going to start becoming dangerous. You, you can start having effects from it, uh, and, and the toxicity is going to start harming your body. So, so that is why you can dive to a certain depth with oxygen, uh, w with regular air uh, as you're breathing gas, but once you get further below that, you, you really shouldn't. Of course, there will be there will be uh, divers that are doing this in their own spare time, uh, scuba divers doing it willingly. They will probably, I can, uh, you can be pretty sure that quite a lot of those who have the certificate of going down to 50 meters, they've probably gone deeper. <laughs> but of course then that's, that's on their own risk. They're doing it in their spare time. They're, they know of the consequences. They've done their courses. They know all of the safety measures that are supposed to be in place. And if they choose to, to risk their own lives, that's, that's their choice. But, but in a work situation, no one is supposed to risk their li lives so, so that then you have to have a legal limit of, of 50 meters depth. So uh, offshore then, uh, we use the saturation diving, uh, especially when we're going deeper than 
30 meters. So, so here, here you just drop the whole 50 meter limit. You just go from approximately 30 meters, then we'll consider saturation diving uh, right away. <coughs> and it is very effective also because with saturation diving, you have to use a diving bell. So, so that uh, you become very effective once you, you can lower your uh, worker down. He can work until, uh, until he can't handle the cold anymore, basically, so that he's freezing too much. Moves into the diving bell again, and you can just pull him up. You can connect to the diving system. You can switch uh, shifts of divers, and then you can just lower down a new diver or a new team of divers that are going to perform the work. <coughs> However, they require very much personnel and very large diving systems when you're doing saturation diving. Uh, and if you have a large diving system, you have to have a large vessel, which requires even more personnel because you need the personnel running the vessel, just running the vessel itself. And it means that having, uh, doing saturation diving, it's really expensive. So here we have an illustration of, uh, of a typical diving system. In the uh, appendix uh, for this part, we have a uh, we're going to look at a, uh, a diving vessel where we're actually going to, to get uh, an even more intimate view of, uh, of how the, uh, how the uh, diving system looks like. Because like here, they have quite a lot of structure around it, so it's sort of hidden uh, from view here. In, in the other one, we have 3D models of just the diving system standing by itself, uh, so that it's a bit easier to see how everything is built up. But you get a fair picture on this one. You have the diving bell over here. You can actually see two divers sitting in there. Usually there is three divers in the diving bell. And that is because uh, you have two divers out working when the diving bell is at the correct depth. Two of them will exit uh, the diving bell and they will do whatever work they're supposed to do. And the third one is backup. So that if something happens to one of the two guys outside, he can come out and help. And, and basically, help will be pulling him into the uh, diving bell and getting, uh, getting them up to the top. But again, if something happens, they're locked in here and they're at a certain pressure. So they can't just open the hatch and go out and have a doctor uh, perform an operation if, if something goes wrong or anything. So, so everything that's going to be fixed, it has to be fixed inside uh, the diving system. I know that in some certain cases, uh, uh, medical personnel have been pressurized. Uh, so, so they have been put into the, the pressurization tank and then been transferred into the, uh, into the diving system after they've reached the correct pressure. But that, of course, means that they have to be decompressed afterwards. <laughs> so, so and decompression, once you get, if you get really high uh, pressures, decompression takes a long time. It can take up to two weeks of decompression if you're at the, the, uh, the deepest uh, I think, think that's down to 300 meters uh, when you're diving, which isn't allowed anymore in Norway. But, um, but uh, I'm, if I remember correctly, Brazil still has a 300 meter uh, diving limit uh, as the maximum. So in, in Norway, there have been too many, uh, too many incidents uh, with diving that deep. So, so uh, in the end, the, the authorities just said that ROVs are good enough to perform the work that needs to be done that far down, so now we just, we're just uh, pulling the plug on diving that far. So, so you're not allowed to go that far anymore. <coughs> but still, um, the diving system, we have the diving bell, which transports the workers to, to the correct depth and back up again. And this is connected, uh, of course, with a crane and everything to, into the vessel. It's lifted onto the ship here, and then it's connected. There's probably some hatch systems or something that we can't see in this illustration. But it will be connected to the tanks that are below here. And they basically look like gas tanks, b b because that's what we're doing. We have gas under pressure inside there. We, we just happen to have people in there also. <laughs> so so it's, it, they, they look just like the, the uh, tanks of, uh, of gas or liquid that you see uh, re uh, trucks pulling by along the road and everything, just like that. It's a cylinder, basically, a, cylind a cylindrical tank, and it's large enough for uh, an adult person to, to stand up inside there without banging their head in the, in the ceiling. And they've made them even larger so that you can actually have uh, a smooth floor uh, that's fairly wide enough, at least wide enough for two persons to pass each other uh, in it. And you can see that it is comprised of several of these tanks. It's not that easy to see in this illustration, but here we have one 
one main tank. Uh, this is probably one that's connected to the diving bell. I think this is the connection point there. And then we have the ladder going up and down to the diving bell. Uh, and this one will uh, probably be more like a hallway uh, where they are going up to the diving bell and down and moving between the other compartments. Then we have other tanks. The one we can see here, we can see there are two beds in there. So, so that's the sleeping chamber of the divers. So you basically go into a large tube and you go to sleep <laughs> on a bed. Uh, and uh, they usually have a residential uh, tank also, more like uh, TV, uh, sofa, uh, the possibilities of sitting around uh, having, having uh, relaxation time. Uh, because they're not only working and sleeping, they have to do <laughs> the regular stuff also while they're in there. They also usually have a kitchen uh, style so that they can make, the, uh, make food and everything. We'll do a break and then we'll continue looking at this one afterwards.
Right, so we were talking about the, the diving system. And as you can see already, by, just by looking at this illustration, which is uh, a fairly small diving system, you can already imagine how huge this is going to be on a vessel, how much space it's going to require uh, on the vessel. So ju just the fact that you have all of these tanks uh, in there, it's going to uh, demand a lot of space. And also the fact that in this system, it doesn't really uh, look like they have several shifts of, of divers working. It looks like they have, have these two divers. We can see two divers in there, we can see two beds in there. So we don't really know if there is more hidden uh, under all of this gear on top. Uh, but usually, when you have a diving vessel, you have three shifts of divers in there. And if one shift needs three divers, that means you have nine divers. So you need to have nine adult persons w living together inside tanks. You're going to have to give them a little bit of space. You, you can't ju just have them completely claustrophobic in there. So, uh, so they need to have the living quarter with the, uh, where they can uh, relax a little bit. They need to have uh, beds. And usually, uh, they, they, ha they have to uh, make do with bunk beds, uh, basically. Uh, with regards to space, they can't have uh, separate living quarters uh, for each of them. So, so they, they, ne they need to uh, realize that they have to basically live on top of each other uh, when they're in there. It's going to be, it's going to be uh, very uh, confined uh, and uh, little space to move around in, but they need to have something, or else they would be, they would be worse off than in a prison cell. So <laughs> you can't really offer that as a, as a working uh, condition. <coughs> Uh, so usually they are even larger than this uh, because you need quite a lot of divers in there. And, and uh, usually when they're doing uh, their uh, diving operations, they are running 24-7 so, so that they have three shifts of divers and each shift works eight hours. So that, that means that we get three shifts for, for one uh, full cycle of the day so that whenever one shift is finished doing their eight hours of work, they are pulled up again. Uh, and then they switch shifts, and the next shift go down, and they work for eight hours, and they are pulled up, and they switch shifts, and the next one goes down. So <coughs> there's a constant working, which means that you are uh, utilizing the, the cost of having this vessel there very well, because you are getting divers doing work uh, around the clock uh, with whatever is going to be done. So, so that... That, that, that's basically the only way you can try to minimize the cost of having a diving vessel in there, is making sure that they're working efficiently uh, for 24 hours each day. <coughs> and usually, when you're talking about uh, offshore work and stuff like that, uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, people working on a rig uh, or something, they usually, at least uh, with the Norwegian rules, they are at work for two weeks, so 14 days, working 12-hour shifts. So they work for 12 hours, then they have some dinner, they go to bed, and then they go, uh, when they get up again, they go back to work, and they work for 12 hours. And they do this for 14 days straight. Then they're brought back home, and they can rest and relax for four weeks before they have to go back uh, out again. So it's sort of the, uh, the, the, uh, the reward for being locked up on a rig for, uh, for uh, two whole weeks, not seeing your family or anything like that, is that you can actually stay at home for a while. Uh, and, and take care of your family. So uh, it's been uh, been a lot of work getting to that point. When I was uh, in my teens, uh, the, uh, the it wasn't that good. Uh, then they were two weeks at work, and they only had three weeks at home. So they didn't have four weeks at home. And when I was a little kid, uh, it was even worse. It was two weeks at work and two weeks at home. <laughs> so uh, it's been better. It's become a lot better, and it's mainly the unions that have been working for this to, to, to get uh, more uh, more leeway in it. Because uh, having an offshore job in the 80s, that was a really hard job. Uh, so you didn't get to see your family all that much, and you were working your asses off out there on uh, in the North Sea, and uh, it could be it could be very uh, very uh, challenging that way. You did earn a lot of money, of course, but <laughs> it doesn't really help earning a lot of money if you don't have time to use that money. <laughs> so, so it's uh, not much point in it. Uh, of course, it might be that the wife didn't really uh, complain that much because she got a lot of money <laughs> to use. <laughs> so <laughs> but uh, usually, uh, at, at least in, I'm, uh, I don't 
think that was too common in the 80s, but at least in the 90s, it was very common for, for, uh, for most women to, to be in work also. Uh, there, were, there was still quite a lot of housewives in, in the 80s, but it was getting better. Uh, but, but in the 90s here in Norway, uh, they really wanted to start working. And, and it, they often got jobs where they had the possibility of not being that too much at work while their husbands were off uh, offshore. Uh, so that they could uh, they could stay home with it and with the children in the evenings uh, and uh, get them to school and all of that, but then they could work full time once uh, their partner was back home. And of course, now there is quite a lot of women working offshore also, so uh, so uh, that can also be a, quite a challenge with regards to children and, and everything. It's uh, uh, I even know, know one couple; they have children and they're working uh, separate shifts, so so they're both working offshore. And they're working separate shifts, so that the, the, uh, they, they only have two weeks that are together. <laughs> but, but then they're completely uh, they're completely off of work for those two weeks, both of them. But, but then one of them goes off to work, and when that person comes back, the other one goes off to work. <laughs> so, so the the poor kids they they're they're either uh, either with one of the parents or then with the other of the parents, and then suddenly both parents are at home. <laughs> so it's a uh, it can be uh, quite challenging uh, stuff like that, but. Um, at least for divers, uh, they just run eight-hour shifts. Uh, they don't run t 12 hours. And that, that's mainly because after six or seven hours at fairly uh, deep uh, pressures, uh, uh, very deep down doing work, they're doing heavy work. So, so they're already getting exhausted by the heavy work they're doing. They're breathing uh, heavier gas, so, so that's... Uh, or, or gas with a higher density than what they're used to. So the gas itself isn't heavier, but it's under a higher pressure, so it has a higher density, which makes it just breathing normally uh, requires more energy than we're used to. Right now, we, none of us are thinking about the fact that we are using energy to, uh, to breathe because it's, it's so minimal that we, we can't really, we can't really uh, feel it or anything like that. But, but for, for divers, they can actually feel when they're, when they're breathing because they're really using the muscles. Uh, and that means that after six or seven hours of work, they're really low on energy. So, so they're, they're cold, they're really tired, their concentration is starting to, to vein so that they can't really concentrate about what they're doing. So after eight hours, it's definitely about time to pull them up and let them relax a bit in their uh, living chambers, watch some videos or, or TV or, or something like that, listen to some music, eat some good food and then go to bed <laughs> and just uh, collapse. <laughs> I imagine that they, they do that at least. Um, <clears throat> so, um, sort of lost my thread there. Um, I was supposed to say something more about this illustration, but uh, we'll, we'll continue on and then we'll uh, see if I can remember it. <laughs> um, here we can uh, see more of a, a cutout illustration, just showing a little bit how the, the systems work. So usually, uh, in the spare time, the divers are in the, in, in the living quarters, uh, relaxing, or in their beds, sleeping. And when they're going to go down to work, they transfer from the living quarters into the hallway and then up into the diving bell. The diving bell is uh, sealed, and of course the living quarters are also sealed and then it's disconnected. It's lifted off, and then it's lowered down to, to the correct depth. And as you can see, this is a very old illustration, so it says from 50 to 400 meters. So, uh, and, and I know there's, there has been uh, dives done all the way down to 400 meters, but just considering the kind of pressure you need to have your gas under there and the density of the gas, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, they figured out that at 400 meters, uh, the concentration level of the divers was so low that you couldn't really, uh, you, you, you couldn't really sort of rely on them doing complicated tasks, doing uh, basic tasks that are easy, basically just repeatable tasks so, uh, and stuff like that, that was okay enough, but you really didn't want them to do any welding or grinding or cutting or anything like that where they could actually harm, uh, harm the uh, equipment that they were working on. So, so uh, just 
tightening or loosening bolts, moving stuff around, uh, things like that was okay enough, but concentration work, that, that wasn't good uh, to do down at 400 meters. So and I, th I think there are still, um, I think there are still a couple of places where they are allowed to dive down to 400 meters, but they don't really do it anymore. But it's still in their laws and regulations that it's possible to dive that far. Um, but you, you, you're really stretching the limits of what, you're, um, what the human body can do when, when you're getting to that point. Yeah. Is that this one? Yeah. It, it looks a bit like that, but uh, it's partly hidden here. Uh, but this is sort of the place where they where they connect the diving bell. So so it's it it is the same system as here where they where they're actually connecting it and they and they get a sealed connection uh, between the diving bell and the pressurized system. So so you you sort of get a hint by the ladder that's going up here. So that's the ladder where they climb up into the diving bell. But it's it's not really a good uh, good illustration because it's they they should have. Uh, cut away parts of the crane here, just to show the, the connection points a bit better. So uh, either that or, or tilted the view a little bit so that we could see it uh, better. But, but this is an isometric view, so that's probably why they have it exactly like it is. <laughs> so, um, uh, but, but it's the same system as here where they have, uh, they have a sealed connection between them. So, and that's very important because uh, they, they couldn't, uh, if they were down at, uh, at 180 meters, uh, for example, and opened up the hatch to go outside and then climb into the uh, into the um, uh, diving bell, then uh, basically opening the hatch was going to blow everything out because of the pressure in there. The uh, pressure was so high that everything was just going to go straight out. So um, sort of like what you see in uh, in uh, in uh, Hollywood movies that take it way too far with uh, with uh, airplanes where they get a hole in the side of the airplane and everything is just sucked outside there. That's not what's going to happen if you get a hole <laughs> in your airplane <laughs> because you don't have that kind of uh, amount of pressure. But if, if you have uh, a pressure of uh, 15 bars inside there, then it might actually happen if you get a hole in it. Then things are just going to be sucked out of there, basically. Or they're not going to be, as, it's going to look like it's being sucked out, but it's actually being pushed out of the, uh, out through the hole. So, so it's very important that uh, you get a, get a proper seal there. And uh, if I remember correctly, there have been incidents where they didn't get proper seals, and there have been serious accidents that have happened uh, due to that. So, uh, uh, so the, the, the main problem there isn't really decompression sickness. It's just surviving the explosion, basically, of gas coming out of it. <coughs> Uh, then we get to a sort of curiosity uh, that's uh, been around for quite a while. Um, I know, um, uh, I can't remember if Jens Christian here uh, actually worked personally on this or if he was just working for a company that worked on this. But we're talking about atmospheric diving suits. And this is basically a personal submarine. So you have a suit which sort of looks like an astronaut's uh, uh, suit. And it is designed to, to keep one atmospheric pressure inside, which means that you don't have to compress your diver, you don't have to decompress your diver. You can jump into this one without having any uh, diving uh, certificates or anything like that. You can be lowered down to whatever depth it's uh, certified to go down to. You can perform work, and then you can come up again, and you can just jump straight out of it. because. Uh, you yourself have not been subjected to any pressure. You just have regular air and regular pressure inside it. Uh, and that's the reason why it's so huge and bulky, because the whole suit needs to be strong enough to withstand all of the pressure from the, uh, from the water around it. So, so uh, it didn't really catch on that much, but this was sort of the, uh, the uh, um, intermediate stage between we know that we can't use divers for everything. It's going to be difficult to continue using divers on, on, on these depths. We have to try to figure out something. So they started looking at this, and then ROVs started really coming along with development. So the ROVs just sort of overruled this one completely. 
when that is said, uh, this, is, uh, this kind of equipment has had a sort of resurgence lately. Uh, many people think it's because of Hollywood movies like Iron Man and stuff like that, where they have these uh, powerful suits that they're using. Uh, but mainly it is because marine biologists and stuff like that, the researchers that want to do research on the water, instead of having to be confined inside a submarine or be confined behind a screen and using, the, uh, using an ROV, uh, they've taken an interest in this because this allows them to actually experience it firsthand and be able to not exactly feel but to touch with, uh, with the claws on the, uh, on the edges there to to sort of uh, go, go down and uh, actually interact with what it is they're doing research on. So, so uh, you, you can find a couple of videos on, on YouTube that are quite recent, 2014, 2015, I think. Uh, there is one project in, uh, in Greece, I know, where they have, uh, have one of these that they're building for, for research purposes uh, on the water. But uh, I highly doubt them ever coming back into the offshore industry to, uh, for oil and gas. That's uh, not likely at all, not considering uh, how far we've come with uh, ROVs. <coughs> so here you can see a sort of uh, half cutout of it, where you have the, uh, the operator inside it. And he has uh, sort of hand levers to, to uh, run, the, run the claws uh, on the uh, suit. And he has, <coughs> you can see it says here he has a CO2 scrubber canister. And he has a breathing mask, uh, which, which the CO2 scrubber canister, it basically means that it's cleaning CO2 from, from the air that he's breathing. So all of the CO2 that he's exhaling, uh, that uh, CO2 scrubber is cleaning it so that he's not breathing it back in and uh, becoming, uh, uh, becoming poisoned by it. So and that's important to have in there. And then there is quite a lot of different joints and stuff to, uh, to, uh, to uh, get this uh, running properly. And you can also see that most of the, the parts here, they are sort of spherical, cylindrical. They're, they, they're all trying to use uh, more or less a cylinder or sphere uh, shape uh, to them. And that's basically because if you, if you start looking at uh, external pressure on something, then it's a sphere or a cylinder. That's uh, the two strongest geometries that you can have. Uh, and that means that they can get away with uh, slightly thinner uh, materials so, so that they don't need to have quite as thick materials uh, when they're making it, which is going to be uh, good with regards to weight and everything for, for suits like this. So with uh, working tasks, we have with the inshore divers, we have regular traditional construction work. That is basically what they do when they're uh, out there working. Sometimes it's cleanup that they need to, uh, there's a lot of uh, garbage being thrown into the uh, ocean. So they need to do cleanup work also. Uh, but that is mostly done uh, by volunteers, uh, most often. With off offshore, we have inspection, both just visual inspection and also non-destructive testing. And uh, if you remember from the ROV bit, there is a couple of the non-destructive testing uh, methods that aren't all that accessible to an ROV, uh, so that it's easier to use a diver uh, for those. They also do welding in habitats, although now the uh, Statoil has developed a habitat that can do welding fully automatically. Uh, but usually, uh, what's been done up until now is to have these uh, habitats lowered onto two pipelines that need to be welded together. They lower it onto, you rem remember we saw that animation, lower the ha habitat onto, they lift up the, uh, the pipelines, move them into the correct position, cut off the ed edges, bevel them, make sure that it's, everything is ready for, for, uh, uh, for the welding parts. And then they pump uh, uh, oxygen in there. So, so they, they pump breathing gas into it, uh, equivalent to the, the depth that they're on, which means that it's going to push all of the water out of the habitat. And that means that uh, divers can enter their habitat from below. So they can swim under the edge of the habitat and come up inside the habitat. And then they can perform the welding in there. And usually it's not the divers themselves. They're not standing there and welding around uh, the entire pipe. What they are doing is 
connecting uh, a welding robot. So they have one of these uh, circular robots that will move uh, along the circumference of the pipe and it's going to, to weld everything into place. But up until now, it's the divers that have been placing this robot there. But now we have this uh, automatic one that can go down to a thousand meters depth. Uh, that's that all has, uh, w which does everything uh, remotely. Uh, but that has been one of the main work tasks for divers uh, in later years is to, to do welding jobs like this. Uh, and they also do quite a lot of maintenance and repair, but then usually on fairly shallow depths uh, and uh, sometimes on, on deeper. And often uh, it might be as easy as there are no ROV vessels uh, available for that time period when we need to do this maintenance operation. So then we're going to do use uh, divers instead because it's not too deep. So it might be that easy, uh, choosing divers instead of ROVs for, for one task. Just the fact that there aren't any ROVs uh, available right then. And the tools, uh, they're generally the same as we use here on land. So they have grinders and everything. Uh, the only difference is that here on land we usually use electrical uh, tools while they are using hydraulic tools. We could have used hydraulic tools here on land also. It's just a lot easier to plug a, a, a cable into a wall socket instead of starting to fire up a full hydraulic system to run it. But they use uh, hydraulics uh, when they do it. One of the problems is that uh, the tools are very poorly adapted to, to being, being um, run by a diver. So usually they are adapted enough to run okay underwater so, so that they have, they have been adapted and given extra sealing and, and stuff like that to make sure that they're going to work properly underwater. But they're usually, well, they can be heavy, they can be difficult to maneuver for, for the diver, especially considering the, the uh, uh, diving suit and all of the gear, the gloves that the diver has on. It's not all that easy for them to, to use uh, the equipment. And that's because diving is a relatively small market, which means that none of the large tool companies are willing to use a lot of money in developing uh, proper diving tools. So instead they just use a little bit of money to, uh, to make sure that their tools are going to work on the water and then the divers have to make do with what they get. So, um, and I, I, don't, I don't see that one changing anytime soon because since we're using more and more ROEs, um, the, the whole diving market is just going to become smaller and smaller. So then we have the uh, current developments. So we have the uh, hyperbaric welding in order to get it uh, completely uh, remote controlled. <coughs> and this was actually tested uh, approximately a thousand meters. I think it was 980 or 990 meters uh, they were down at, but approximately a thousand meters. And that was in uh, Sognefjorden, uh, north of uh, Bergen there. <coughs> uh, and also they have done, uh, on, on the Oscar field, they've done a hot tap. We've seen animations for this one. That was when they had fluid passing through the, uh, the pipeline. So there was still uh, producing fluid uh, through the pipeline and they were connecting uh, a different pipeline onto it. So, so they were uh, welding on the outside of the pipeline. So they were putting on, uh, on a, uh, creating a T uh, intersection in the pipeline. So they were putting down the T part and they were welding uh, it into place and then they cut through it once they had uh, made, it, uh, made it completely sealed. So, so um, that's one of the, one of the uh, uh, new developments that have been done. Uh, I think uh, there's five or six of these uh, hot tap uh, projects going on or already completed uh, since that first one. And just to brag a bit by, uh, of my old employer, Menko, they've, they've had a hand in both of these uh, stuff. They all both uh, had the engineering on the hot tap part and they also had the engineering on the, on the, the remote welding habitat. So um, they've uh, done quite a lot of good work uh, in the past at least. So here we can see the remote welding system, which is a, uh, 
use a stat oil video. And you can see that's the pipeline repair system. That's where we have an excursion uh, out on Chillingay. You remember these from an uh, earlier animation, so these H frames. Well, those are still the same ones that are uh, used uh, for, for uh, divers doing the welding, also. are actual images from, from uh, Sognefjord when they did, did the test there. Here it takes quite a lot of time to weld it, up to 48 hours, depending on, on the diameter of the pipe. process on the other end of the, the uh, pipe section that they're installing. more here. 
Yeah, which is the hot tap. So yeah, they've already prepared the the pipeline a bit, so they've removed the the coating from it, so that they've exposed the steel of it. And here they're coming down with a clamp system. And inside the clamp system, they already have the uh, piece of pipe that's going to be be welded onto onto the pipeline. So then they come down with with the welding equipment. So they weld all the way around, getting a uh, complete seal against the pipeline. Then they remove that entire rig, which was just for for the welding, <laughs> and then they come down with a new rig. And as you can see, there are some uh, valve stuff uh, around here. So they're going to, to close off the system. So they've made a tight seal here, and now they're drilling into the pipeline. And they have a large ball valve here that they can close off. And this means that now they can come in with another pipeline and they can connect it to the top there. And then they can open up the ball valve and then they have full flow into. So then that's one way of connecting a new, new subsea well from uh, somewhere off and you can connect it to an already existing uh, pipeline. The way stuff like this was done uh, before uh, was that they sort of tried to uh, anticipate where they might have to connect uh, to a pipeline and they would uh, pre-install these before they lowered the, uh, lowered the pipeline down to the ocean floor. But that was often very difficult but they, because they usually didn't manage to anticipate it correctly so they, they, they were usually far off with regards to where they needed to connect. So have, having a system where you can actually do this uh, directly and still keep, keep full production flow going through the main pipeline while you are doing an operation like this, that is uh, really game changing you know, with regards to uh, being able to connect new, uh, new smaller subsea wells to, to already existing infrastructure. So it means that you can start, uh, you can start uh, extracting from uh, reservoirs where you, smaller reservoirs where you originally thought that it wasn't going to be possible to extract anything from that one. But now you can just have a subsea well and connect it to already existing infrastructure. Then you don't need to, it's not going to be all that expensive to, uh, to build what you need to extract that reservoir. So it, there might be enough, uh, enough uh, oil or gas in that reservoir to, to make up for it in earnings. In this one, there is no uh, no pipes being cut off. Um, in the previous one, they had to stop uh, production because that was uh, in in the previous animation. Uh, it was uh, the case of a pipeline uh, springing a leak. So, so then you have production flow leaking into the ocean, which is a huge environmental disaster, basically. So, or, or at least possibly, I if they catch it in time, then then they're going to be able to to do some something about it uh, and fix it before it becomes too bad. Uh, but um, uh, something like that means that, for an example, if that happened in, uh, in the Langeled, the, the 1,100 uh, kilometers long uh, over to Great Britain, delivering approximately 20% of the gas to Great Britain, if something like that happened, uh, a leak like that, they would have to shut down 20% of Britain's gas uh, delivery. 
and then they were, that's why they have this pipeline repair system over at uh, Chillinge. It's because their only job is to be ready in case something like that happens. Because uh, I think they have a response, uh, they're going to tell you more uh, in detail about that when we're in the excursion. But they think they have a response time of just a week or something that they, uh, they need to have gotten all of their gear on to an appropriate vessel and be off. So they don't need to necessarily have reached the location, but they need to be on the way to the location at least within a week. Uh, and uh, then as you can see, just the welding uh, on one side of the pipe might take, uh, might take up to two days. So it's going to take a couple of days to do all of this, uh, at least uh, probably a week or so. Uh, they will most likely give us more information about that in the uh, excursion. But uh, it's going to take quite some time uh, to do the repairs also. So potentially, if it happened on, on Langeled, uh, it, it would mean that uh, Great Britain would have to uh, have to manage without 20% of the gas for a couple of weeks. So uh, that's going to make a, a huge dent in their energy uh, consumption. So uh, because they're pretty dependent on, on gas uh, over there, they they use it for both for heating and for cooking and uh, quite a lot. So uh, no, it's not like Norway where we use uh, electricity for basically everything. So um, uh, it, it's pretty important. And that's also why you saw the in the last clip, uh, it was Statoil and then you had Gasco. And Gasco is the company, uh, it's a, uh, the Norwegian government runs Gasco basically. I think they're the, I think they own more than 50% of it. So they're the, they're the uh, main owners of it. Um, and their sole purpose is to monitor all of the uh, exports that we have uh, from our fields. So they're the ones monitoring everything going on uh, in our pipelines. So it's very important for them to, uh, to be able to ensure their uh, customers down in Europe that we're on top of this. If, if something goes wrong, we're going to fix it and we're going to fix it very quickly. So compared to, uh, to a couple of years ago uh, or a couple, uh, a couple of decades ago when it would have taken quite a lot of time to, to repair something. <clears throat> well, as this one, this one isn't a, a, a repair. Uh, this is more uh, connecting uh, something new to something old. Uh, so, so, but, but it's uh, giving you quite a lot of uh, freedom uh, with regards to where you want to start, uh, start new new projects and, and uh, exploit new fields. <coughs> and here is uh, a hyperbaric welding situation. This one is old enough to definitely be with a diver. So you can actually see the uh, diving bells uh, there. There's the diving bell. I think that's the diving bell at least. Um <coughs> uh, and that's just an old illustration. I don't think you have that one in your compendium. Uh, just one I got from uh, Jens Christian, uh, so nice to uh, nice to get to show. <coughs> and then we have was there one more? No, this was the last one. Yeah. Uh, when when they cut the pipes, you, you get water into the pipes. Yeah, yeah. So so they put those. Uh, you can see they put those plugs in before they welded. So, so uh, when they cut them, you get water into the pipes, and then they put the plugs in. And I think the plugs are there with regards to to uh, trying to avoid having too much uh, dirt from from the welding operation ending up inside. I'm not quite sure what the, what the plugs are for exactly, but uh, uh, but they they plug them afterwards, so they do get water into the pipes. So they need to flush their pipes afterwards uh, uh, once they're done uh, fixing it. I mean, the way that is done is just start up production again and, and whatever you're producing is going to push the water out in the other end so, so that uh, you're, going to, you're going to get rid of it pretty quickly uh, anyway. But, uh, but you can't just start up production again and send everything straight to your customers because then you would suddenly have uh, seawater being pushed into your uh, gas lines in, in, in uh, whatever city it is that is going to in, uh, in Great Britain or or in uh, Germany or wherever uh, they're getting this gas. So uh, you, you really wouldn't want that. But, but, but they have facilities uh, on the shore where, where the uh, pipelines uh, arrive uh, at, the, at the shoreline. So they have facilities there and they have more than enough uh, equipment to be able to separate the, uh, the water then uh, out, of, uh, out of the pipeline. So uh, it's something that they do afterwards instead.
Ya. Yeah, yeah, because um, e even though it's in uh, in the pipeline, for an example, Langeleid, that's going to uh, to Great Britain. Uh, at Easington in Great Britain, where it arrives, uh, this pipeline, they have a huge plant there. So, so, so that uh, they uh, they sort of get all of the gas coming in continually. But the gas being used out in the system, that's there's not really many people uh, cooking food in Great Britain in the middle of night. So, so in, uh, in the nighttime, there's not all that much gas going compared to the daytime. There is still some because they have a gas heating. Uh, so, so there's quite a lot of gas still being used, but not as much as during the daytime. So, so they sort of have to um, uh, uh, sort of receive the gas, and then they have to distribute it as necessary. So they have the, the equipment necessary to, to uh, sort of get the water out uh, once uh, that one uh, arrives. So that's uh, that part, but that's more of a, uh, a uh, processing technology <laughs> question. Which isn't really my strong suit, so, <laughs> so I'm not going to to go too far into it. Um, <coughs> I think I will actually stop there. We, we have the appendix that we're going to do. Uh, the one I'm going to show is, um, um, as you can see here, it says on mine it says September 2013. I think it says August on yours. So there's a couple of extra slides on the one I'm going to show, but that's that's everything that's uh, different from it. So then just to remind group A for the CAD lesson today, we are doing four hours of lecture. And uh, for, uh, also for group B tomorrow, we are also doing four hours. So I've switched around this week and next week. With regards to, so then I have, uh, have the possibility maybe of doing uh, a little bit overtime next week if we're uh, almost there, but not quite. 